Hey all, Bina007 here to introduce the Vassals of Kingsgrove Best of 2017, in which individual vassals just shout out the books, music, film, TV shows that they really loved. And maybe it's a place where you might find a few recommendations for stuff you can get into this year. Everyone's going to introduce their own segment and what they're reviewing. So without further ado, here's our Best of 2017. This is Alex, also known as I Deal on the forums, and I want to talk about an album that came out in January 2017, and that was basically the soundtrack to the entire first half of 2017 for me. I listened to it so much. The album is called In the Passing Light of Day by a Swedish band, Pain of Salvation. Pain of Salvation, according to Wikipedia, is progressive rock, progressive metal, and new metal, although I'm not sure where they're hearing that. Basically, they have a prog sound. They use a lot of syncopations and interesting rhythms with sort of heavy riffs, but nothing too violent. This album in particular is very melodic. It has a lot of vocal harmonies and softer passages with strings and oboes and all sorts of instruments. Another thing they use a lot of is the sort of retro organ keyboard sound. It sounds kind of bluesy. They have a wide variety of musical influences, and this album in particular is pretty special compared to what they usually do, because it was the first time that two songwriters worked on a Pain of Salvation album. Usually, Pain of Salvation is led by Daniel Gildenlow, probably saying that wrong, um, who is the lead singer and guitarist and songwriter who writes all of the music and all the lyrics of all the albums. But a few years ago, they were joined by another guitarist who is also an amazing songwriter and had written a lot of material before that he'd never used. So this album was the first time they collaborated on a full-length album. And what makes it even more unique, unfortunately, is that they will no longer be working together because the guitarist left the band last year. So it was kind of a wine time thing. It makes this a very unique piece of art, in my opinion. And I'm. it's a bit bittersweet that it won't happen again, but I'm very happy that we got this record out of it. Um, this album, I would say, is on the whole quite soft musically, but more intense thematically. Um, Basically, Pain of Salvation always writes concept albums in some way or another, and this is no exception. The The whole album is about a personal experience in the lead singer's life, where he was in the hospital for like six months, and he talks about his illness, how he coped with it. So if you want to listen to some rock music, some cool, intense, emotional, instrumental passages, and some beautiful vocals, and some sad lyrics <laughs> sorry it's very sad but it's it, it's very beautiful and very interesting as a music nerd i really love all of the songwriting that goes into this so please check out in the passing light of day by pain of salvation they're a metal band they have a bit of a dramatic name but don't let that stop you they're really amazing musicians Okay, bye. My name is Glenn, Tycho Travis from the forums. And I'm Hannah, Shadow Baby on the forums. We want to just briefly mention um, Black Mirror, which has recently been released on Netflix Season 4, and something that we were both, well, Hannah was quite surprised about. I was hyped up for, for it for the past year, so it's quite a big highlight for me, one of the things I've been waiting for, anticipating for the past year, and it's so far been excellent. I've watched half the, the series so far. Can't wait to watch the rest of the episodes. Yeah, and I binge-watched them all in one night. I <laughs> stayed up all night. One thing, though, I did read the, the synopsis for each of the episodes, and I was sort of let down, because, you know, when you read about what the episode's about, and you sort of think, oh, I don't know if I'll enjoy that. But the, um, so I've just sort of, like, cherry-picked the ones that sound the most in- interesting so far, mm. and then made my way through the other episodes. I know that um, the one... Um, the one where she murders the man, and then everyone has all these, um, there's this device where you can track that person's memories. That one I've enjoyed the most. Mm. I I just love this show because it raises so many ethical and 
sociological like questions how would you react uh, how are we going to respond as a society to advancements in technology i mean it's all sort of near future none of it is really like that far off from the truth i don't think and it can be very dark but it's so thrilling and the way it's presented is it really makes you think hard about your life and these people's lives well, I'll tell you what, too. Uh, the first episode, uh, a friend of mine at work told me, you got to watch the show. And it was one that kept coming up in my Netflix suggestions. And I don't know, it's, you judge a book by its cover. Never really caught my eye. So I, when I did finally start watching it, I didn't realize that it was standalone episodes. And I'm watching this first episode, which is oh man, probably the most like shocking one, I think, in a lot of ways. And I'm just sitting there going, like, how are they going to move on with a story from this? How will they ever top this? You know, I know. I, I, watch this, I start the second episode. I'm like, what does this have to do with that? And then I realized, <laughs> oh, it's like the Twilight Zone. Exactly. You know? Yeah. <laughs> and it's great. I mean, it's such a, a modern, updated version of the Twilight Zone that, that delves deeper, I think, into like what we are as a species and, and those kind of really metaphysical questions and issues it tackles in such a graceful, thought-provoking way. Yeah, um, and it's funny because some of them are sort of heartbreaking and soul-crushing, and then some of them are just kind of nice little stories. Uh, and we're we're going to talk about one and do an episode on one particular. I think, and I think it's a great choice, especially for people that haven't seen it yet, because it's a way to kind of ease them into the series. It's not the darkest episode known to man. We're going to do Hang the DJ and. I think that's a really good choice. Yeah, I'm looking forward to talking about it. It's, I guess, the first... Well, I know that people have talked about a few episodes before having happy endings, but I think this one truly does have a happy ending. And yeah, I agree. Um, It was kind of refreshing, you know, and especially for it to come kind of at the midway point in this season, it it was like coming up for air. Because some of them are very dark, you know, which isn't a problem, but can be really heavy, you know, and a lot of that to digest at once. Hey everybody, this is Adam, also known as uh, Drown Snow on the Forums, and I figured I would give you my pick uh, for one of the best shows of 2017, Um, something maybe that a lot of you haven't seen yet, a show called Godless, which is on Netflix, it dropped kind of late in the year, Uh, it's a short series of seven episodes, um, each a little over an hour, hour long, most of them. And I'm a sucker for a good western, so of course I decided to check it out. Um, with us having no uh, Westworld this year, I figured you know give this a try. And I must say I was uh, I was quite pleasantly surprised. Uh, it features um, some people you know. So Jeff Daniels is the kind of the main villain. Uh, he plays the outlaw uh, Frank Griffin. Um, there's Michelle Dockery. She was on uh, Downton Abbey. Uh, Scoot McNary, which is just a fun name to say, but uh, you might recognize him from Halt and Catch Fire, which also ended its four-year run this year, which was an excellent show I would also recommend watching. Um, And uh, Thomas Brody Sangster, who you will recognize as uh, Jojen on Game of Thrones, is in this, uh, as well as a number of other actors who uh, really knocked it out of the park. So the main focus of the show is around this um, outlaw... Uh, Frank Griffin and this town of La Belle, New Mexico. Uh, the town is almost entirely women because most of the men like died in a tragic mining accident. So that adds kind of an interesting twist, uh, seeing all these women uh, take on you know, different roles, roles we don't traditionally see in Western films sometimes. Yeah, and without uh, giving away any spoilers, the show adds yeah, a very brutal uh, feel to the Old West with kind of modern storytelling mixed with, you know, kind of some classic Old West tropes, if you're into that, which makes it a lot of fun. Uh, but just the great cast, great scenery, it's well shot, the score is great. Um, I mean, they use a lot of real horses, it looks like they use I mean, a ton of practical effects. Yeah, and it definitely does that thing that I, I always want Westerns to do, that like a really good Western that I'm watching, even though the world is brutal and it sucks and you didn't have iPhones or you know electricity or anything back then like it's so beautiful that it makes me imagine living during that time 
something about the freedom of the land being unsettled and wild, and I just, I mean, I think I binged it all and you know, in like two or three days, because just I had to get through it. That'd be, I'd say that'd probably be my top ten, one of my top ten for 2017. Definitely something that I would recommend uh, a lot of the vassals check out. Hi there, this is Glenn Dago Shrevers from the forums. My highlight for TV for 2017 is a little known, little watch show from the UK. It was called Armchair Detectives. It was an afternoon TV quiz show, but with only one question, who done it? Fifteen members of the public, the armchair detectives, were present for all 20 episodes, and three played each episode to guess the killer, as they watched different clips each day set in the fictional town of Morkliffe. I still can't really work out why the people were there, why they continued to come along each day, because there was no cash prize. The prize for winning was a golden magnifying glass, but by the end of the series, most of the armchair detectives walked away with two or three of the magnifying glasses anyway. There was a so bad it's good feel to it, especially with the horrible acting in the scenes in Morkliffe. I think that Susan Kalman, who presented another show that I loved called The Boss, um, presenting style and making fun of it, along with the audience participation, saved it. Not exactly a guilty pleasure, but I loved nothing more than coming home after a long day of work, watching this in bed during December, even though I was rubbish at solving the mysteries. If you are interested, you can catch the episodes on YouTube. Hey, it's uh, Mary, and I'm Mary on the forums. Uh, we're here to talk about Big Little Lies for just a few minutes. Um, I have two amazing people with me, Alex. Hi, I'm Alex. I'm Wendy on the forums. And Glenn. Hi, Glenn here, Taco Shreppers from the forums. Great. So the idea is that we did actually record a Big Little Lies uh, podcast, I mean, a few months ago, but the recording got lost. So My we fault. thought this was a good, <laughs> it, it, this was a good opportunity to maybe talk about the show. Oh, can we also um, talk about how excited we are that it's coming back for a second series? Absolutely. <laughs> Especially based on the fact that it's, it is based on a novel and the story ends there from series two series one so we are series one left off and it's pretty accurate between the book to the show so um that really sur surprised me that they're going they're coming back with a new story yeah it's surprising but it's it's great because uh it was really really strong in season one so if they can do something close to that it's gonna be it's gonna be awesome yeah i haven't read the book but i'm also very excited for season two so to me, it's really a, a show about women coming together and finding their, their strength in themselves and in each other to overcome some really brutal things in their lives. And it's, it's a very, very strong show emotionally. The cast is really awesome. It raises a lot of great questions and issues about education, marriage, the consequences uh, your past or present life can have on your children and it yeah it was really uh, really powerful to watch I think yeah it was not only the cast but also like the directing and the music and the way it's shot was to me also really immersive I guess like you really felt like you were living with these people for the duration of the show and really getting a glimpse into their lives and the stories really keeps you on the edge of your seat the whole time even though it's not a very fast-paced show where a lot of stuff happens it's more it unfolds over time yeah the show did have a lot of positives so exotic location being set in california a-list cast and also i was quite gripped from episode one you know just Simple premise starts off very simple, mothers taking their children to school and then it just explodes from there on. And I really loved the, the storytelling and was quite hooked on each, each of the episodes. The narration is interesting because basically from episode one we know there's a mystery and uh, the police is investigating and they're interrogating our characters but that's in the future and in the present we see the story unraveling that element that did remind me of a book that i once read called dead famous by ben elton which has a similar state i don't know if 
I can't remember if I mentioned that during the Lost podcast, or not, <laughs> but it's um, you know it's set in a fictional. Well, it's the main premise is in a Big Brother type style house, and there's a murder committed despite all the cameras around so it's set in flashbacks and police interviews yeah i think i'm I'm watching the affair at the moment and it's a bit it's it's true it yeah it's like that too so yeah they got eight awards at the emmys this year uh including best lead actress best supporting actress and actor and best limited tv series yeah the whole cast really is amazing yeah yeah you could you could actually uh you could give each of them an award. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the only reason not all of them got one is that it, it's because uh, some of them were in the same category. So, but I, I do believe that both Laura Dern and Shaining Woodley were nominated for uh, yeah. Best Supporting Actress. So, <laughs> they're 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 all great. And Nicole Kidman, it's an amazing role for her. She was really, really incredible. Yeah. Probably. Also. Just yeah. the, because we started off by talking about this as the second season, but I just <laughs> want to add that as a, as a one season show, it was already great. Like it wraps up neatly, which is probably because it ends where the book ends. But it's also not hard to imagine why there would be a second season without giving away too much. The ending is kind of open. So I'm I'm excited to see what comes next. And for those in the UK, you can watch it now. It's on Skybox X. Awesome. Awesome. And it's not a big uh, time in investment. Like you have, it's it's, no, it's seven, yeah, seven seven episodes. episodes. Yeah. Seven episodes. Uh, one hour each or something like that. So yeah, in short, go watch Big Little Lies if that's not done already. Yeah. Thanks, guys. You too. Bye. Hi, I'm Natalie, or Bren the Beesling, on the podcast of Ice and Fire forums. Yeah. And hi, I'm Sarah, also known as Lady Weaver, on the forums as well. Okay. <laughs> so, my pick for the drama that I personally had the most fun watching this last year is Black. So, this one, it's a sci-fi drama okay so the basic plot is that it is a detective possessed by a grim reaper and that there's this girl her name is haram and she can see the shadows of death so she can see the shadows of the grim reapers around and it's about her trying to her and the detective trying to save the lives of the people that they see grim reapers around and trying to save their lives and for the grim reaper it's about him breaking the rules of heaven that's a really bad synopsis, by the way. Maybe I'm no, it's at, so. it's it's a pretty complicated drama, I think, and things change so drastically from what you originally think the plot will be. I know. Um, like from- I just was not expecting that to happen. <laughs> I've seen maybe six episodes of Black, mm. um, and I, I like it. It's really different, I think, from most K dramas. From the first three episodes, things change very drastically because with the first three episodes, you're introduced to one major character and then after those three episodes, they are no longer a major character, but they still play a very large role in the story. And I think this drama was very well done. It is definitely a sci-fi drama, so if you don't enjoy shows that shows like Supernatural, then maybe this one isn't for you necessarily. Yeah. I don't know. How would you describe the show's feeling or vibe? I would say it is maybe more fantasy than sci-fi. Um, yeah. Um, it is about, yeah, Grim Reapers and death and a girl who basically has this curse that she can see these shadows around people and knows that they will die soon. And so she becomes kind of an outcast in society because she's she just seems so strange to the average person. Um, the but, average person is also terrified of her abilities and don't understand mm-hmm. it. Yeah, either people don't trust her or they just think she's crazy. Yeah, and so it's really interesting actually seeing this character because... I've watched a few um, 
shows where maybe the main character can see ghosts or something like that. But I don't think I'd seen a character that was so, I guess, downtrodden kind of because of their abilities. Just it rather than abilities, she, I think, would see it more as a curse on her life because it's driven so many people away or she's just been unable to, to do things about it, you know? So she really makes a change and tries to do something about it from this point on. And I think that's really interesting. It is. It is very, very interesting. And she really does make a change. She makes a concerted effort to try to avoid her ability to leaning into it and trying to make a difference and use her ability for the better. Yeah, I think she's my favorite character, but I also really have a soft spot for the Grim Reaper. I think he's so oh, interesting. I, I was just Grim not Reaper. expecting him. Um, I was not yeah. expecting that to happen. And so he just, he essentially has to like acclimate himself to humanity. And he's just so funny in the way that he like does not care about humans. <laughs> He, he really does not care yeah. at all. Uh, and then again, we get to see his journey and how he changes from exactly. the very first time we see him to the very last time we see him. And there is such a change in his personality and he has changed so much over the course of this story. Yeah, I think it's a really well done series. It's it's pretty beautiful, I think, especially the opening um, song and everything. The opening song reminds me of the James Bond opening from <gasps> Skyfall. So that much. is so accurate. It's so accurate. It just seems like the characters are just falling and falling and falling into this like darkness. And it's so well done i just think the the show is really beautiful in a way like the way that they do the cgi too it's just so it's a really well done show and i think they don't overdo the cgi they use it when they have to but if they don't need to do it they won't yeah that's really accurate yeah and yes no their actors in black i think are all really really good and and the lead actor Son Sung Hun is he has a very very large role to play and he plays it incredibly well and you can see two clear distinctions with him I don't want to spoil anything but I know and I think actually the female lead is kind of perfectly cast for this because she's so she's so beautiful and she has really gorgeous eyes and her eyes are like a huge part of the show and the plot, you know? Um, they are, because she goes from hiding her eyes behind sunglasses all the time, so she can't see the shadows around people and their like impending death, to mm-hmm. no longer wearing them and no longer needing them, really. And it's. She's a really. She does a really good job, I think, um, she, playing she her is. character. Yeah. And it has its comedic moments too. <laughs> it does because um, I think a lot the of the police Korean... force I think is pretty funny. <laughs> They're so good. No, but with a lot of Korean dramas it's it might be a serious drama but they'll still have comedic elements and this yeah. one stays very very true to that because it is a slightly more serious drama but it has a lot of romantic elements and it has comedic moments in it so like you aren't watching an episode and the whole time you aren't like oh my god this is so serious and so sad and okay so by the way so this drama has 18 episodes they are all out on netflix and they're about an hour and a half each on average Mm -hmm. but it's so good and i i know i personally just um i marathoned them like Mm. as fast as i could watch them because it was so good I caught my roommate watching Black, and she has probably never seen a Korean drama. Yeah. I was so shocked. I caught her watching that. She was like, well, it sounds really cool. <laughs> and it's on Netflix. Yep. So if you have a Netflix subscription and it sounds cool, why not just try it? Mm-hmm. Because you're already paying for it. So makes it easier. All right. It was nice talking to you. It was. It was lovely talking to you, too. All right, bye-bye. See ya. Hi, I'm David, David HHH on the forums. 
The Sci-Fi Network's 12 Monkeys was easily the best show of the year for me, one of the finest seasons of any show I've ever watched. It's the story of people from a post-apocalyptic future where a plague wiped out most of humanity, going back in time to try to prevent the cataclysm. But they find out that there is a secret group called the Army of the 12 Monkeys, along with shadowy leaders, that were behind it all, and all of time is soon at risk. It's loosely based on the Terry Gilliam movie of the same name starring Bruce Willis and Brad Pitt, but it's much more complex. It's very smart science fiction with a capital S and a capital F. And time travel done right, with time loops and paradoxes and effects before causes and real consequences for people's actions, but with tons of heart. Great characters that you grow to love and care about, including many of the strongest women characters on television. But they're very complex characters with mixed motivations. Characters switch between being protagonists and antagonists and vice versa. What would you do if you were trying to save the world but discovered that you had a son that you never knew about who will no longer exist if you succeed in saving the world? And they're never afraid to really shake things up on this show and even kill major characters. Every season, the show makes massive twists and change in directions that you never saw coming. With time travel, things that happen in the beginning have their origins and things that happen years later. The show even manages to constantly surprise an old-time science fiction and time travel show fan like me, who sometimes feels like I've seen it all. But 12 Monkeys constantly blows my mind. And ultimately, the show is largely about these great characters trying to make the best out of impossible and impossibly convoluted timey-wimey situations. Bravo! They also did something interesting with the show last year, with Sci-Fi airing the entire season over one weekend for binge-watching for one of the first times on a non-streaming television network. I'm not sure that it worked out for them, since I think it got overlooked in the fast release, but the fourth and final season will air on Sci-Fi in the summer. Hi, I'm Natalie, or Bren the Beesling, on the podcast of Ice and Fire Forums. So I recommend um, a Korean drama called Stranger or Secret Forest. I watched it because it was on Netflix, and also because the two leading actors, uh, Cho Sung Woo and Bae Duna, are actually more film actors and maybe international actors rather than in TV. And so because they were really famous, I'd seen them before and I just was curious to see what they'd done. Um, Bae Duna was in sense She was one of the, the eight characters. And so... Um, these actors are just so amazing. It's actually really rare, I think, to see a film actor in Korean dramas. I mean, a bit like American TV, but I just think they did an amazing job. So Stranger is actually about a prosecutor who investigates a murder, which kind of leads him down this rabbit hole that causes him to uncover corruption in both the police department and the prosecutor's offices. And so he's trying to investigate this murder and other incidents while navigating through this ensemble cast of police characters or prosecutors or um, people in their department who he's unsure whether to trust. He really doesn't know who he needs to trust and who he needs to watch out for. And it's really an ensemble cast. I thought at first that I would be confused because there are so many people with so many motivations, but they do a really great job of showing you everyone's past and really delving into what they're interested in, what their motivations are, and whether or not the main character trusts them. Um, so the main character is Wang Shi Mok, and he had a hearing issue growing up that kind of made him an outcast in the sense that he caused a lot of outbursts because he would have some kind of like painful hearing episode that could be triggered by like a dog barking or the scratch of a pencil. And so he underwent this surgery in his teens that interfered with his ability to feel emotions. So maybe this is the most kind of unbelievable aspect of the show because um, it's a little unscientific in the sense that it's like, well, this character has this issue. So he had a surgery and now he can't feel any emotions. (laughs) But actually, 
the actor does such a great job that he plays this character that's so different in the sense that he's pretty cold and unfeeling, but he's also just intelligent and analytical to a point that he can figure out so many things just through interactions with people. And it's actually just so fascinating to see him while he's going through this murder scene or trying to figure out whether he can trust someone, just the way that his mind works. Um, I think the show does a really great job of uh, showing that. Um, and so while he's investigating this murder, he ends up working with Beiduna's character, who is a lieutenant in the police force. And in contrast to him, she has a really warm and generous personality. So their dynamic is actually really adorable in the sense that she kind of gets him to open up a bit. And I think he kind of realizes how lonely he's been since he doesn't really have any friends. He just works all the time. And so just the two leads have such a great dynamic that I wish there was a second season that I could continue to watch them um, as their relationship grows. I would say my drama is a more serious kind. I don't think it has, it has its comedic moments, but they stand out completely. And I will just watch those moments over and over just because they're so like heartwarming in such kind of a cynical drama. Uh, I mean, it's about corruption, basically. So it's, it's, it's pretty dark, I would think. It's not exactly um, the most silly or fun drama you could watch. So it takes a little bit of brain power um, because it's such a smart drama. And it really keeps you guessing because there are so many plot turns and you know, you, it reveals characters' motivations a little slowly. And so you kind of think one way about a certain character and then something gets revealed and then you realize it's something else. So it's just really interesting. But I, I went through it really quickly, even though there are probably 16 episodes, I think. And yeah. usually they're about an hour long. That's how most Korean dramas are. Um, and I just looked this up, and apparently this show was on the New York Times list of best TV series of 2017. So that kind of made me feel validated <laughs> in my taste. <laughs> so I really recommend it. Hi, this is David again, David HHH on the forums. 12 Monkeys may have been what I thought was the best show on television in 2017, but the CW's DC Comics Arrowverse crossover, Crisis on Earth X, was definitely my favorite. The Arrowverse is four series on the CW network, all based on DC Comics superheroes and teams, Arrow, Flash, Legends of Tomorrow, and Supergirl. Every year they have a crossover on the shows, but this one was everything you could hope for in a superhero crossover, and everything that Justice League, the movie, should have been. This crossover involved a major wedding being interrupted by an invasion of doppelgangers of our heroes from another universe where Nazis have taken over the world. It was tons of fun, but with lots of poignant moments, character development, and some of the best superhero fights I've seen involving dozens of characters in every episode. You don't have to have been watching any of the shows to enjoy this crossover, but if you have, it will pay off with some amazing character moments. It had me laughing and cheering and bawling my eyes out in the end. I've always been a huge fan of DC superheroes. The Arrowverse usually does get them right, but this was perfect. It made me a very happy nerd. A few runners-up I wanted to briefly mention. Sensate was amazing as usual. I'm glad Netflix is giving it a finale to wrap up with, although I will miss these characters when they're gone. Doctor Who got its groove back again last year with one of its best seasons in years. Unlike many series, Orphan Black ended just perfectly. I'll miss the Sestras. The Expanse just gets better and better. More very smart science fiction set in space. Legion showed us that superheroes could also be very smart. Samantha Bee and John Oliver are always hilarious, and Game of Thrones was still great despite all of its flaws, which we've discussed endlessly in great detail on our Vox Show podcasts. Thanks. Hey, this has been a 007 with one of my best of 2017s in the realm of film. It's a small documentary called AlphaGo, which I watched at the London Film Festival, and it's about the advances in artificial intelligence. It's a really fascinating documentary. It features a team of programmers based in London called AlphaGo, and they're part of Google's DeepMind project. 
And basically, they've taken the Chinese board game Go, which is seen as infinitely more complicated than chess, and a real benchmark of if AI can beat a man playing Go, then this is a real advance for computing. And they get their program to a certain level. They just teach it the rules of um, Go and then just let it work out how it wants to play it itself. And they pitch it in 2016 against one of the highest rated Go players in the world, who's this really diminutive South Korean guy called Lee Sidol. And apparently Go is really massive in South Korea. When this five match game is being played, it's up on kind of billboards and live TVs and their equivalent of Times Square. The whole nation is watching. None of the South Koreans believe that a computer can possibly beat the guy. And of course, the AI comes in. It beats the guy hands down um, in the first few matches. The guy kind of has like a quasi nervous breakdown on screen, which is really hard to watch because his little daughters in the audience changes his style of play and then they carry on. I think what's really fascinating about this documentary is you get to see a human reaction to AI in real time, which is really deeply affecting. And at first it's shock and almost horror that how can this computer beat me? But then it's kind of almost like a, a respect for the elegance of the way it thinks. And this guy is so impressive and magnanimous. He's sort of like, well, you know, Go's been played this certain way for thousands of years, and now we will learn a new way of playing it and we will learn new moves. But what I also found fascinating is what I also found fascinating was is there was a, one of the match, the fourth match, where the computer just went crazy. It just started playing moves that made no sense. It somehow got itself into this iteration that it couldn't break out of. And that was also quite scary because you have at once this thing that can learn faster, learn better than a human, but can go haywire. So for all of you fans out there of dystopian movies where a computer like in Terminator decides to terminate people, then... This is both quite funny to watch as the humans are just basically laughing at the computer, but also simultaneously quite petrifying. Um, I'm fascinated by the concept of AI. I'm fascinated by what machine learning is going to look like and how we as humans are going to interact with it. I think there's something really fascinating about the time in which we live. You know, we're moving forward from a period where if you think of that famous chess match with Garry Kasparov, um, the IBM machine basically just beat him by sheer brute force processing. What's so different about this is you're watching a machine learning in real time, learning from the opponent of how they play, like catching his tails or whatever, and adapting. Um, that's the future, right? We're going to have to somehow learn to live with machines who can think better and faster than us, not lose our complete self-esteem, somehow figure out we're all going to have jobs in this economy and get paid for something. Um, and not let the machines like kill us all because we serve no actual useful purpose. <laughs> but anyway, that's just me getting carried away and being all doom laden. This is actually, it's just a fascinating film. It's human against machine. It's a really lovely South Korean guy. It's a game I didn't know anything about, but don't worry about that because it really explains it well. And even though I knew the result of the match, and obviously, you know, the result of the match, otherwise the film wouldn't have been made. It's actually super tense when you're in the room watching it. And I love films that manage to create that tension, even when you know the result. So AlphaGo, I'm not sure kind of how widely it's going to be released because it's an independent film, but I'm sure you can probably find it on streaming services if you search for it. Thanks for listening. Hey, everyone. This is uh, Paul, also known as Sir General on the forums. And uh, Bina uh, kind of put out a thing on the forums asking for uh, things we found in 2017 that we became very interested in. Uh, it is kind of more of a nerdy focus. So uh, I initially sat down and went, oh, I could talk about Star Wars The Last Jedi because I'm a big Star Wars nerd. Or I could have talked about, like one of the many, many uh, new canon books that I have also been reading this year uh, for Star Wars. But you know what? You know what? I'm going to stop my Star Wars addiction right now. I'm going to put that aside and actually explore something that I found very recently because of The Last Jedi. Uh, my friends and I, we were going into the theater, we were sitting down, we had our popcorn and our drinks, uh, and the previews start, and the previews are one of my more favorite parts of going to see a movie, simply because not only the ambience of being in the theater, but then you get to see, oh, what is coming up? And sometimes the previews are, in fact, better than the actual movies themselves, and you actually can go, oh, that looked amazing! 
without having the harsh reality of showing up to the theater to actually see the movie and have it be terrible. But I'm not going to be too negative uh, because I saw this one preview for uh, this rather steampunky universe where a mobile London eats a uh, smaller town or looks like it eats a smaller town. And then the title comes up, and it says Mortal Engines, and Peter Jackson's involved, and I I am a fan of Peter Jackson. I hope this doesn't go the way of The Hobbit. But, uh, yeah, it caught my interest enough that I kind of went, oh, it's a book series. Well, I'm usually the person who's kind of like, well, I kind of want to read the books before I see the movie. That's how I was with uh, Harry Potter, and how I tried to be with Lord of the Rings but I was very young at the time and found Fellowship of the Ring impossible to get through. But anyway, uh, the book is essentially set in this kind of post-apocalyptic Earth. Uh, a 60-minute war sometime after the... Sometime, I think, in like the 23rd century or so, uh, basically destroys any stability the Earth's crust has and forces cities t- uh, to become mobile. Because if they stay in one place too long, they'll eventually just be destroyed by earthquakes or volcanoes. Uh, the book itself takes place around like maybe a thousand years after that, where uh, humans have some humans known as the Anti Traction League have actually settled down behind this large wall of mountains that has cropped up uh, in Central Asia. But yeah, basically everything to the west of these mountains is now uh, filled with mobile cities who kind of practice this thing called municipal Darwinism, where uh, small towns prey on, basically scavenge what they can, large towns uh, gobble them up, and... Uh, cities gobble those up. And then sometimes they're gobbled up by larger cities. Uh, And so this is where we find our uh, kind of main protagonist. It is kind of like a Game of Thrones, where you'll follow some characters off doing something, and then immediately jump back to London to find out what characters are doing there. And you come across this apprentice for the Guild of Historians, because... London is now essentially run by these guilds. You have the Guild of Navigators, who are responsible for piloting London, the Guild of Engineers, who are in charge of developing technology, the Guild of Historians, who are responsible for cataloging, the Guild of Merchants, and so on and so on. All of them under the rulership of the uh, Lord Mayor. So essentially, it's just this apprentice, Thomas Natsworthy, teaming up with the scavenger named Hester Shaw, it's uh it's just a really good read. Uh I can see I'm running out of time so I got to got to speed through this. Uh it is filled with morally gray characters. You are never really sure if they are a good person or a bad person and in the end it kind of leaves you wondering whether or not certain people can be trusted. Uh I would definitely encourage people to read it so I can talk about it more on the podcast. Uh but yeah, uh, Mortal Engines, it's a good read and would definitely I would encourage people to simply just read it themselves. Hi, this is Bina007 with my best book of 2017, although it was actually released at the end of 2016. It's called Blitzed by a German um, author called Norman Ola, but it's been translated into English. And it's basically about the use of drugs by the Nazis in World War II. And I have to say, as a bit of an armchair historian, I've read lots and lots of books about Hitler in my lifetime and studied um, the rise of the Nazis to power in school back in the day. But I've never read a book that so single-handedly changed my view of key events. And it's really lightly written. I don't think he's a professional historian. I think he's actually a musician or something by background. And he just got into this um, idea when apparently a DJ friend of him said casually, oh, yeah, but we all know the Nazis were on speed. And he decided to go and investigate this. And apparently lots of the records of the Nazi regime were actually in the US because when the US invaded um, sections of Germany, they just sort of swept up lots of medical records and took them. And he reckons he's the first one to just go through the archives and that a lot of conventional historians have just ignored the medical records. And you have these daily cards by Hitler's personal physician just chronicling what he was given as, as drugs, what he was given as injections. 
And you can match those up against decisions that were taken and meetings that will happen and just see the impact. What's amazing to me is when you think of the Blitzkrieg, the Germans just rushing through Western Europe and conquering most of it. All those troops were on this pill called Pervitin, which is basically speed. And that's how they were able to just drive through the night as a tank battalion. The British realized they were all on speed and then started researching their own drugs. And later in the war would give their soldiers Benzedrine, which they thought was safer. So it had a massive impact. In terms of Hitler himself, what I find really ironic is that he was this massive vegetarian, teetotaler, clean living guy, trying to put out that that's how you kind of function best as the, as the leader. And yet the guy was hopped up completely and increasingly from 1943. He was started off taking vitamin injections as Operation Barbarossa in Russia goes from bad to worse. He is taking uppers, downers, he's taking cocaine, um, he's taking heroin, so he's on speedballs. He's also, his doctor was this really weird guy who got Hitler to give him the rights to all the animal byproducts in the Ukraine. And with these kind of livers and kidneys and shit, He was basically mashing them all down, extracting what he thought was the kind of, I guess, the adrenaline from them and other other things and injecting them straight into Hitler's bloodstream. So basically, this teetotal vegetarian was hopped up on, well, class A drugs, but also a whole bunch of animal products, which is really ironic. And apparently near the end, it got really hard to inject Hitler. He had track marks, um, just like a heroin addict. And because he was pumped so full with all these animal products, his blood had become thick and coagulated. So, yeah, it's if, if you ever see pictures of Hitler up until about 1942, he actually sort of looks younger than his age. And after that, he ages massively. His hands are shaking. But if you wonder why he would have a meeting with Mussolini and suddenly go from being lethargic to utterly manic, yeah, it's because he had a cocaine injection. And if you wonder why, after the attempted assassination by Klaus von Stauffenberg, he was able to be on the radio and looking very sort of fit and agile and, you know, superhuman and surviving it and not shaky at all, it's because, again, he was pumped full of drugs. And when you look at the, the strategically bad decisions he made, I think a lot of that can also be ascribed to drugs as well as his megalomania. Interestingly, the book tells us that it wasn't just Hitler or indeed the common troops who were hopped up, but even his key um, supporting officers. So one of the things in the war that's always puzzled me is why there was this halt order. The tanks of hopped up soldiers are chasing the British basically into the sea and suddenly the tanks stop and this stop allows the British to escape at Dunkirk, see Christopher Nolan movie. And why did he do that? Why did he let them go away? And apparently it's because his um, second in command, Hermann Goering, who was a total heroin addict, was very jealous of the army and wanted the Air Force to kind of finish off the problem because the army was seen as old Germany, old Aristos and the, the Air Force was seen as very Nazi. So that's what causes the halt order. It's jealousy. It's irrationality caused by a strategic decision taken by a guy who's a total junkie. So anyway, this is a great book, really easy read, absolutely fascinating and just really gives you a new aspect on World War Two if you're really into it. So that's Blitzed by Norman, Norman Ola. Check it out. My name's Alex, also known as iWendiel on the forums of a podcast, Vice and Fire, and I just wanted to give a shout out to a book that I started in 2017 that I really enjoyed, even though I'm still not finished with it. I've been reading it very slowly, taking my time because I like it so much. It is SPQR, A History of Ancient Rome by Mary Beard, who is a British historian. And the book is all about Rome and the history starting from the mythical founding of Rome up until the end of the Roman Empire. It's a very well written book if you're at all into history, if you're at all into ancient Rome. It's very well written, it's easy to read, it's very witty and intelligent, and it's also a very nice book to have. It has a lot of pictures, of well not a lot of pictures not like on every page i there's still a lot of text but it has um a spread in the middle with a few pages that are in color with paintings and pictures of artifacts flipping through it right now there's also like paintings from much more recent times of interpretations of events of roman history and 
common theme through most of the book is how our interpretation of these events has evolved throughout the years, how our understanding of what might have happened can be warped by our present day way of thinking and she throws shade at a bunch of historians along the way. It's really fun. Um, yeah, so I just want to recommend this book to anyone who's vaguely interested in Rome. I hadn't read anything about Rome since I stopped taking Latin in high school. So it had been a while, but I'm still really into it. And I think even if you know nothing about Roman history, it's still a really interesting read because it's written in a very approachable way. It kind of feels like she's talking directly to you, which is really cool. So go read it. SPQR, A History of Ancient Rome by Mary Beard. Bye. Hey everyone, Bina007 back again to close out the show. Thank you very much for listening. If you have your own recommendations, please leave them on the forums at a podcast of Ice and Fire so we all get to read stuff, listen to stuff, watch stuff that maybe is a bit outside our comfort zone and we might not have found otherwise. Otherwise, you can find us as ever at vokpodcast.wordpress.com and on our YouTube channel. Thank you for listening.